Hello, everyone, and welcome to the end of the season. We are at the end of season one with episode 50. What that means is we'll be taking a week off next week, and then we'll be back on April 30th with Bride by Allie Hazelwood. Now on to the rest of the episode. Right, guys, before we begin this episode, I would like to just put a little warning here that you should go and read the trigger warnings for this book. There are a lot of more, more mature themes uh, regarding addiction and self-harm issues, and if that is going to trigger you, please do not listen. We don't want anything to to affect your mental health, so please keep that in mind before you listen. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Looking for Love and All the Wrong Dust Jackets, a show where three disgruntled harpies talk to you about everything we love in romance, whether that's books, movies, TV shows, whatever we like. My name's Liz. I'm Danny. And I'm Wiggles. And welcome to the episode. This is the last episode of season one, episode 50. <laughs> You're welcome. Wow. And it's, it's a lot. This week, we are discussing Seven Days in June by Tia Williams. Uh, But before we get into that, uh, I have to warn the people. I have to let you know that we are crass. We're unhinged. And so just a general warning. We swear. We talk about all sorts of naughty times. And if you're not into that, that's a you choice. That's not a me choice. That's a you choice. Anyway, let's get on with the show here. Um, What you gals been up to? Talk to me. Let me let me know what's in your lives. Well, I finished uh, this week uh, another one of the improbable meet cute things. So I did The Exception to the Rule by Christina Lauren, and it was pretty cute. And then I read something that was not cute at all. Uh, I read I'm Glad My Mom Died by Jeanette McCurdy. So that was sad. But funny. It's a it's an autobiography about well Jeanette McCurdy. Go Who'd figure. It? Um, and her her life growing up as a child star and the things that her mother put her through and her coming to terms with the fact that that was not loving mother behavior. So yeah, is it as good as everybody says? It's on my like TBR. Like I'm gonna try to get to it really soon here. It's very well delivered it's um the audiobook she recorded herself which mm-hmm. is really good and it's very got a very dry delivery like uh which is right up my alley the the only issue i had with it is um it felt like somebody did not help her on editing it and oh. so there are times where it like fades in weird but you know it's fine uh but other than that it's a good book i i i would recommend reading it okay Danny? I was in a mood this weekend. So I spent a lot of the weekend rewatching Orange is the New Black. Hmm. You didn't say Grey's Anatomy. I did not say Grey's Anatomy. It was Orange is the New Black this weekend. Um, And then I played Among Us with you bitches. So we do demand a lot of time. What'd you do, Liz? I finished Always Practice Safe Hex by Juliet Cross, which is the fourth book in the series, I believe. It's good. I mean, the entire series is just like really fun and playful. Uh, I've yet to find any of the sequels be as good as the first one. And I think that's just because it was so silly and ridiculous with Alpha. Uh, And for some reason, she spends an absurd amount of time in this book, like an entire chapter explaining the guys playing a board game called Gloomhaven, um, which I haven't played, but I've definitely like seen people play. I completely forgot about that. But it's enjoyable. So I like them. They do have tentacles. That's right. There are tentacles in this one, Mm -hmm. like smoky, shadowy tentacles. Mm -hmm. And then I read Three Kings by Fridis Moon, which I read for the Trans Right Readathon, which we are right in the middle of here. It is a trans poly story about this couple who run a lighthouse. Uh, Well, one runs a lighthouse and the other uh, is a fisherman, and they end up rescuing a selkie and then 
trying to figure out how that exists in their relationship. So it's super short, but it's really good, like a 4.5. Like, it's just so delightful. I enjoyed it a lot. Nice. And then I just took a hard left and did something very different. And I read or listened to The Deep by Rivers Solomon, which is a short ter novel novella based on the song The Deep by David Diggs. And the audiobooks is narrated by David Diggs. And I have like 15 minutes left. So I'm finishing that up now. And it is about merfolk though they're not called merfolk who originated from african slave women who were thrown off of the boats uh and then like gave birth in the ocean and those babies became merfolk essentially wow yeah Yeah, it's it's fascinating it's also a little like confusing because chapters jump between different characters and i it's very jarring when it happens uh but other than that it's really enjoyable and it's just very different than what we normally read Nice. Yeah. I also love me some David Diggs. So, yeah, him talking mm-hmm. to me is great. It's a great time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Well, let's get into the book here. Do we have anything about the author this week? Yeah. Cool. She conveniently, see, she knows what she's doing. She's got a <laughs> section in the back. And that's all I'm asking for. It's just, it's just a section in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tia Williams. Okay. So she had a 15 year career as a beauty editor for magazines, including Elle Glamour, Lucky Teen People and Essence. In 2004, she pioneered the beauty blog industry with her award winning site, Shake Your Beauty. She wrote the best-selling debut novel, The Accidental Diva, and penned two young adult novels, It Chicks and Sixteen Candles. Her award-winning novel, The Perfect Find, is being adapted for Netflix for a film starring Gabrielle Union. Sign me up. Okay. It's already out. What? Yeah. Well, I'm going to find that. I think, let me just double check when it came out. The Perfect Fit? Is that what it's called? Perfect Fit. Perfect Find. Perfect Find. Perfect Find. Yeah, it came out last year in June. Dang. Well, I'm going to check it out. You should check it out and then uh, let us know if it's any good. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe we'll do an episode on it. Sounds great. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. I don't know why I got adversarial there. <laughs> I don't know either. Tia is currently an editorial director for Estee Lauder Companies and lives with her daughter and husband in Brooklyn. Also, I had to look it up because I was like, how is she so well describing what it's like to have chronic migraines she herself suffers from chronic migraines so that's a not fun fact fun fact yeah a bum fact i'm gonna stick with that yeah bum fact yeah uh also something to mention there's a lot of discussion in this book that's really nuanced and we are three white women who of course can't speak to that with authority so um there are a lot of really great black creators that i suggest that you check out to talk about this i think this is a fantastic book to to read and consume but there are things about this that are experiences that we'll never be able to fully understand so do bear that in mind absolutely that said danny what is this book about This book is about Eva, who is a single mom. She is a best-selling romance novelist. She is currently, at the beginning of this book, in the process of writing the 15th book in in the series that she's been writing. And she is going to – it's an award ceremony, I believe, of some sort. And she – well, no, she was on a panel. And then um, in walks Shane, who is – the guy that she fell in love with for a week when she was a teenager while they did not good things. There was some addiction involved. He he is an addict. He is clean now, but you do not simply become not an addict. You will always be one. You're just a recovering one. Mm-hmm. And all this time, she's she's actually been writing the books describing him as the, as the main character. Hit the four books he's written. Yes, yep. four. Four books he's written were about her. And so they are kind of thrown in together and trying to kind of figure out how to be around each other again while simultaneously she's like, uh, hell no. And hilarity ensues. Not really hilarity. It's actually kind of crushing in moments. And she also has 
a disability, an invisible disability that she is dealing with and trying to hide from everybody around her. Nobody in uh, nobody knows about these debilitating migraines that she has in her public image. She doesn't let people see that portion of her. So it's really fascinating. And I really am excited to talk about this book because it's very good. It's a very good book. Yeah. So where should we start? I feel like since you kind of just like let us in there at the end, one of the things that we could easily start with because it colors the entire book is her migraines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think she ever names a disease in the book of what they are. They are just constant consuming migraines. And now I don't really suffer from migraines. I think I've had like a handful in my entire life, Uh, but I've had, you know, severe sinus problems for most of my life. And I remember before I had surgery to fix it, just how depressed you become Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. it's not even the pain you're in. It's like, is this just my life? Do I just exist in constant exhaustion and pain? And that really colors most of this book. I I had a few moments when, especially early on when she's describing what it's like, where I was like, I genuinely, like I said, I had to go and check. I was like, how do you know this so well? Do you know somebody who goes through this? Do you go through it? My migraines never got to the point that she's had where she's like, she describes having hospital stays, having fainted. I've only thrown up because of my migraines like once or twice. But some of the things that she says, like about it being this like invisible disability, because everybody thinks yeah. that they they're like, oh, I've had headaches before, so it's the same thing, mm-hmm. and it's like, no, it's I swear to God, it is fucking not. <laughs> but like the way she describes it coming on all of a sudden, the way that you just your temples hurt so fucking bad, and there's there's one line in there where she's like describing the noise in the room and. uh it it was so accurate. She was like, my God, did somebody open a candy wrapper in Connecticut? And I was like, <laughs> do. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like you nailed it so well. And I was like, oh, because you get it. You you've lived it. That's why I wasn't fully ready. If I'm being completely honest, like another thing she talks about is, um, in order to cover it and continue her life, she becomes the girl who flakes out on plans. She becomes the girl who who drops a word in the middle of her sentence. Um, she becomes the, the, the girl who always has to go deal with an emergency, mm-hmm. in air quotes, right? Because she needs to get away. And it's mm-hmm. like, oofta, hey, hi. That's, 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 uh, that was what my year, uh, that was my life for three years. I can't imagine that being my whole fucking life. Mm -hmm. I don't know how, I don't know how she survives it, honestly. Well, and I don't have chronic migraines, but I do get them from time to time. There's no every week or anything for me. It's every couple of months I get, I get one, but they are the instant just boom and takes your breath away kind of thing where all of a sudden it happens and the noise thing for me is a huge trigger the the candy wrap somebody did somebody open a candy wrapper in connecticut hit me hard too i was like yep mm-hmm. yep because immediately if anybody i already overhear things because i have adhd so noise is really distracting to me already and then you add that pain on top of it where the noise hurts me well and what i I think she does really well to demonstrate, but doesn't really call out too much is that there, it isn't just that you're having a migraine. It's the, the recovery period. So when you're Mm -hmm. having like a migraine, let's say you're only having two or three a week, which sounds like a lot because it is, but like, you know, there was a point in my life where I was like, thank God it's not every day. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. In between those, you're still recovering from a migraine. So Mm -hmm. like you, you don't necessarily have as much pain, but you're groggy, you're exhausted. You have a lot of brain fog, which makes just even having a conversation feel difficult because you are reaching and reaching and reaching for words that you can't find, even though you know them. And so, yeah, I was just like, holy fucking shit. Because here's the other thing. I've gotten far enough uh, in dealing with my migraines that I have seen what it takes to get to the next pain treatment levels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you have to fail 
over and over and over again, these medications. Like when she's talking about how like pain management is a nightmare and she finally gets a doctor who like actually is dealing with addressing the pain. It's true. You have to fail medication. Yeah. And that takes so much time. Mm-hmm. They, they're they like, try this for three months. Oh, that didn't work. Try this for three months. Mm-hmm. That didn't work. Try this one for three months. Well, and that's, so again, I didn't have migraines, but I had, my sinus cavities were just completely full, like to the point where it wasn't, you know, just, oh, take a decongestant and that will fix it. They literally had to surgically laser them out. And so imagine the worst cold you've ever had and just Mm-hmm. that's life. The amount of doctors that I went to and would just come home depressed because all they say is, oh, I can't really tell what's wrong or here, just take this. Uh, here's a steroid shot that might help. And so just like it's it becomes so exhausting and expensive yeah. mm-hmm. just to go to all of these specialists until you finally find one that's like, maybe we should do a CAT scan. And I'm like, yeah, maybe we should yeah. do a CAT scan. One, I really like that the way she described it is an invisible disability. Mm -hmm. Like, we kind of talked about that before, but like, because people have this idea of, of, well, if you can work, like, get past it, that it's not disabling, but it fucking is. Yeah, absolutely. And the way that she talks about it, I'm just like, ah, like, I I kind of want to, like, hug this woman. I don't, I I don't, I won't, I won't ever attack you, I promise. But like, (laughs) like, I'm just like, Oh wow, you really you really put a fine point on it in a way that like especially if you're in the middle of it describing it to somebody you're like just please for the love of god go away. I don't want to tell you why I'm in pain or how I'm in pain or how much pain I'm in. I want to be left alone. So the idea of having to explain to somebody your voice alone makes me want to die. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, there's a scene towards the end of the book where she's at the award ceremony. Mm-hmm. And she finally just like erupts and tells the the table that she's at why she has to leave. She, she just finally ex- like tells them. And one person's response is, do you need an aspirin? She's like, no. Well, no. She, her response to that is, uh, and I can't remember if this is in her mind or if she actually says it out loud, but like if an aspirin would solve my problems i could be, like it surmises to i could take on the world yeah mm-hmm. like as in nothing could stop me because I, i've just been dealing with this the whole time if all i had to take was an aspirin and i didn't have to deal with this pain do you have any idea what i'd be capable of mm-hmm. and the thing is i also want to compliment the the writer on not making it something that goes away when it would be convenient for it to go away absolutely it doesn't yep. it doesn't Right. So in the middle of her having these romantic uh, moments with Shane, she's also still fucking dealing with it in the middle of her having important moments with her daughter. She's also still fucking dealing with it Mm -hmm. in the middle of her getting awards and being lauded for her success. She's still fucking dealing with it. Well, that's the that's the the thing in a lot of romance books right that the dick fixes it whatever <laughs> I, it's true it, it is true. right you're not sorry wrong. it's just the way you the delivery it. was just great thank great. you so much uh, i mean i will not coin that phrase i have seen it out there in the world i did not come up with it but that it, whatever problem the main character has as soon as they get a good dick in it goes away thank yeah. god for that dick or i yeah. would have had this chronic health condition for the rest of my life <laughs> But yeah. that's not what we have. That is not how that works. No. It's, it also does a really good job of demonstrating who the people in her life are, are worth keeping, right? Mm-hmm. So like even the difference between um, her ex-husband and Shane. Shane immediately wants to help in whatever way is possible. He's a teenager who doesn't know what the fuck he's doing, makes some bad choices on that front, but like wants her to feel better if possible right Mm -hmm. the way her ex talked about it is he didn't want a patient he wanted a wife and i'm like fuck i had to set the book down for a minute i was like fuck you yeah i I took on on her behalf i took a 10 minute because i i listened to the audiobook i took a 10 minute tiktok break after that line i was like nope i need i need miniature horses and and dogs pretending to faint so that they can have cp loons i need some happiness for a minute Mm. 
I will say, though, while they did paint him in a bad light at that time period, you know, their child is quite a bit older at this point and everything. She's 12. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they have they have learned to effectively co-parent together. And that would have been very easy to turn him into the villain of the story. And she did not. Well, they have a whole conversation on the phone about it, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is Eva asking him am I hard to live with or whatever? And he's like, no, I just wasn't ready Mm -hmm. for it then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I I really appreciated that whole conversation in that moment because she could have just turned him into the asshole that dumped her, blah, blah, blah. And that's the fact of the matter is that is that reality is more nuanced than that. He wasn't ready. And I get that even though it's kind of a dick move. And he knew about it from the beginning. You know what I mean? Well, and she even says like she was the one to leave mm-hmm. right yeah she was like oh the first the first sign of you they went to therapy once right mm-hmm. and so the first sign of you showing me that you could potentially want to leave i will leave first mm-hmm. yeah and she even says later on in the book that like she she made sure after shane left that she was not going to be left behind mm-hmm. and and she was going to do the leaving but also, this is well represented in the friendships that she has. They, I think it's Cece, if I'm remembering yeah. right, mm-hmm. is the one who comes to live with her for a year when things really got bad mm-hmm. and help her take care of her daughter. And Belinda's the other one, if I'm remembering right. Yes, yes. Belinda. Um, th- like, they, they're they checking in on her and going, are you okay? Like, do you need this? Do you need me to run interference? Right? Like, the the people who do know... That she's allowed into that inner circle are are worth keeping there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love that her friend just drops everything sometimes and she's just like, party. We're having a party <laughs> in like four hours. And you're like, what the fuck? I also appreciate that it's not because she is whimsical and just like, oh, I want to have a party tomorrow. It's like, I am conniving. I'm putting all of my people together so I can get exactly what I want. And we're going to do that via this party. Gee, who does that sound like, Liz? Look, I know who I am. You puppet, <laughs> you puppet master so many things. Not as many as you think. I do love to take credit for things, though, that happen later. <laughs> yes. I have watched you puppet master many things, though. It it's it's a singular singular joy I get. Um <laughs> I do I didn't like that Audrey, her daughter. Is it mm-hmm. Audrey or Audra. 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 Okay. Her, her daughter later in the book is like, I'm gonna text the sneakiest person I know. <laughs> <It's insane>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just want that. I just want somebody to be like, this is the sneakiest person I know. And I'll be like, yes, I am. Thank you. <laughs> Mission accomplished. Thank you. Yeah. And it's my auntie. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, I think you can get there. I'll work on it. Yeah. I freaking love Audra. Yeah, that kid is... I love uh, and hate that kid. She's a lot. Yeah. Yeah, she is. But she cracks me up. I appreciate the fact that they had the fight, but then she's she's big enough to kind of sit back and understand, you know? Well, Audra has, I think, a thought that a lot of teen and tween girls have had which is wait a minute am i the burden Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. am i am i the one who's causing you know this distress and problem and like turning all of your your external pain inward but it it does show the relationship that she has with her mother that she can actually then say that Mm -hmm. yes Mm -hmm. she can voice her concerns and talk to her about it did she need just a little bit time to think about it yes and guess what you get to take that time well, and the fights that they have aren't unjustified. No. Right. You know, and honestly, that those fights are significantly more civilized than fights that I have witnessed over dumber shit. Yeah. That's true. By a long shot. And, which, again, speaks to, to Eva as a parent. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. They, I don't think the phrase ever gets used, but she's very clearly focused on breaking cycles and making sure that she is a present and caring and aware parent. Mm -hmm. One thing I think the author did really well is she gave us a lot of insight to Eva's relationship with her mother, Mm -hmm. Lizette, because, well, we get the flashbacks to when they were, when she was in high school and her mom comes home late, brings home guys that are uh, not, not appropriate to be around your teenage daughter. 
Mm-mm. not really appropriate to be around anyone. That's true. Yeah. But she still presents herself as like loving or trying, or at least that's what we get from the teenage perspective. Mm-hmm. But then we get that one chapter. Uh, I don't even know if it's a full chapter, but it's a few pages that's from Lizette's perspective, mm-hmm. which broke my fucking heart because it's Eva calling her to ask her questions about Shane and Lizette's like inner monologue is always things like well how come she got this boy right away to like love her and stick around where none of my guys stick around yeah Lizette's point of view was so heartbreaking it was so clear that she almost thought of Eva as her friend as her confidant Mm -hmm. and had that level of jealousy like why does my friend get to have this great love but all the guys i'm with that's what like that's the kind of monologue it felt like she was having in her head and not i want my daughter to be happy right Mm -hmm. and then the like well but then you went on to like be famous and have everything like Mm -hmm. you've had all of these things Mm -hmm. look at your life and it's like fame doesn't mean happiness though well yeah you are missing the point woman well, I don't think she sees any of the choices she's made as being uh, fallible. Right. Yeah. I don't think she's ready for the conversation that Eva would have to have with her to regarding what her childhood was. Like, she still doesn't understand why the therapist said, I think she needs space from you. Mm-hmm. She, th- she thinks that was completely out of line. Well, I think she's going to have a real rude awakening when it comes to because Eva decides that she's completely done writing these this romance series that she's doing. She's not going to release book 15 and she's instead going to go and write the history of her family through the matriarchs because she knows her her mother, her grandmother and her great grandmother's names and everything and approximately where they grew up and everything. And she's going to tell the truth about them. She has her daughter's entire life kind of romanticized her her mother to her daughter and everything because she wants her to love her she wants her to you know think of her and so she's kind of romanticized these women to her mother and now she's deci- er, to her daughter and now she's decided that she wants to write the, what the truth of what her family line was and everything and i think it's going to be a little bit of an, a uh, bad bad time for her mom when the book comes out you're talking about eva is didn't tell Audra the truth about her family. Yes. And that's going to... I think it's going to be a rude awakening for Audra, but I think it's going to be a rude awakening for her mother as well. For Lizette, yeah. Yeah. You know, I think Audra's pretty smart. Um, yeah. And so I think there might be a, a bit of a blow up, but I think it's going to smooth over as quickly as the other fights did because I think there's no way she's not putting two and two together that she hasn't seen her own grandmother since she was two years old yeah. and that that doesn't there's not a reason for that right yeah well especially because her mom's a her mom's an author a best-selling author like there isn't there is no i couldn't she can't afford to come here when right you know eva could buy her a ticket to bring her there right well, and apparently Lizette is kind of got her life on track to a certain point because she is this renowned pageant coach. Yeah. In, in, in Georgia? The- that was, is that where it was? I think so. I can't remember. It was somewhere down south. Yeah. Which gives me the heebies. Mm-hmm. All the pageant thing gives me the heebies. I I'm I don't I don't have the mental energy to get into that I won't lie. <laughs> it's it's actually a pretty nuanced discussion to have. It is. It just I oh it always kind of makes me go. Ugh. Yeah. Okay. So we've talked about all the other relationships a little bit here and there in Eva's life, but we should definitely talk about the main one, which is Shane. Well, and is he the he the main one? Like he's the one we're talking about in terms of the relationship that's core to this book. Sorry, that's what I meant in the yeah. book. That's no, not her main relationship in her life. Right. That would probably be her daughter. I would hope so. As she should be. Um, so uh, Shane and Eva, whose actual name is Genevieve. Huh? Genevieve. 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 Met in high school when they were both seniors in D.C., as misfit outcast kids and then went on this 
alcohol and pill bender for a week. A week. Mm -hmm. And romanticized it for the rest of their lives. Yeah. Yep. I guess, so for me, this is the question I don't know if I have answered, even at the end of the book, where, yes, clearly there's still a lot of feelings there. There's a lot of emotions. There's a lot, a lot of unfinished business is a, a term that Shane uses at one point. But they they almost act as though they're, like, fated to be together. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I can't decide whether the author is trying to tell us that this is a happy ending or a sad one, that they're back in each other's lives. I honestly don't know either. Same. Right? Especially because the book itself doesn't have a happy ending. I mean, it, it does. It has like a happy for now-ish ending, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's not like that big magical ending. I almost prefer it that way, though. Like, I kind of am glad it's not a, like everything's fine situation. It's a we're figuring it out. It definitely feels more real to the book. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm truly hopeful for both of them that this yeah. works out, yeah. right? But I think that there's this impossible to resist pull between the two of them, whatever you want to call that. Like, if you want to say it's true love, if you want to say it's this emotional connection that no one else is going to have from their past, mm -hmm. right? That, that like, that mm -hmm. connection, that bond that, you just can't build new. It's uh, You're never going to be the same person you were as when you were a kid. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that that fixes a single one of their problems. And, I, mm -hmm. and it doesn't seem like... It, like, Shane has to depart from her in order to check his own alcoholism, right? And so, uh, like, yes, they've come back into each other's lives again, but is that going to last? That's so hard to tell. And you like you really want to root for the two of them. But also at the end of the day, uh, Eva's going to make the choice that protects her daughter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As she should. As she should. Well, and she does that because skipping all the way to the like end of the romance. Yeah. Sorry. I kind of pushed us there. <laughs> no, it's okay. Because Shane, and I don't know how much I liked this choice. Like I get that it created this conflict. But Shane misses out on a a brunch that Eva and Audra have every year before she goes away to spend the summer with her dad. And Audra invited him and, and she was so excited. And then he just like no call, no shows. And then Eva just decides like, okay, you're out then. I don't know that I totally agree with that assessment of what Eva says because it feels like he's the one who pulls away. Like she ultimately is saying like, we can't do this, but it's like she's voicing his thoughts too. Mm -hmm. Well, but I mean, mentally, even before he comes and explains why he missed the, the, the brunch, she already is mentally like, I can't have you in my life if you're going to like flake on me and stuff, which I get, but it was such an instantaneous response. Yeah. She didn't ever go through the stage of it of, I wonder if something happened to him. Cause you kind of, if, if you get no call, no showed. You kind of go through a stage of, did something happen to them before you get to the, well, fuck you then, you know? And it did feel like she missed a step. Yeah, she has like one thought where she goes, should I be calling the hospitals? And then she just immediately breezes past it. Well, I think, too, there's this mental block, if you want to put it that way, where it's like, if her her first thought of if something has gone wrong... It's not that he was in an accident or something like that. It's, should I call the hospitals because he, did he go off the bend again? Yeah. Did yeah. he start drinking? Right? Like it's, it's, it's very fear-based and I don't know that it's fair of her exactly, but also you've known realistically, like if we think about this, you have known each other for two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, like. That's all you know of each other's lives, good, bad, ugly, right? And I, I think that it, there's a lot to be said that they have seen their each other's bests and worsts. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> that doesn't change the fact that am I going to put my child, my life, my sanity, when I've already got this other heaping pile of problems I've got to deal with, am I going to put all of that at risk for somebody I've known 14 days? 
And I get that. But I do think you hit on something there, which is the Mm fear-based. And that is a big part of Eva's, I don't want to say personality, but like her trauma response to everything. Mm -hmm. And she does kind of address it a little bit towards the end of like, I need to stop running from things or I need to stop hiding my illness from people. Like I have to stop operating in this like survival mode all the time. Mm -hmm. And I think that in her mind, her suppressing a lot of these things and pushing them down and like hiding her disability. Right. That is her doing better. That, you know, and I think a lot of us fall into that trap where Mm -hmm. if I just bury all the feelings and pretend they don't exist, I'm basically cured. (laughs) Maybe that's works. just me. Um. <laughs> no, but I get it, right? Like that yeah. concept of if I appear put together on the outside, that's a success. Mm-hmm. Then we're good. Yeah. So we kind of skipped over like Shane reappearing in her life, though. Well, so the reason I wanted to kind of jump to that ending is it feels once you get there, it feels inevitable. Like, it feels like Sisyphus. Like, it's going to happen. You're mm-hmm. just, you're going to keep, you're bound That's to right. hell. And when, which is sort of why I don't know if this is a happy ending or not. I'm, I'm in my heart, I'm going to say it's a happy ending. I've decided for them. They, they live a wonderful, happy <laughs> life from there on out. But, you know, their, their first meeting in many ways is so cute right in she, high school she, yes yeah. she walks up to him she has this hey i am determined i'm going to actually make friends and you're like oh and he's like the he's clearly got a little bit of the like i'm a huge grump on the outside we'll fuck your shit up on the outside but he's like if you if you poke at it long enough you will get to the soft gooey center right, right. and so they have this immediate connection leading up to this drug filled week of i don't even know complicated things as yeah. i'm gonna say and so when he comes back into her, her life it is intentional but isn't and none of that's resolved so it w- is there a way that he could have come into her life where they wouldn't have reached that conclusion anyway maybe it would have been more than a week maybe it would have been a month down the road something happens but it was it ever possible for them to right the ship from that initial meeting no especially because like they are still recovering from shit yeah Mm -hmm. one of his big things is you know he grew up in the foster system and he lost his 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 original like foster mother in a car accident when he was like seven or eight or something Right. When she was taking him to the hospital because he broke his arm. Yeah. And he blames himself for that ever since, as well as just like never being able to like have a family and have these deep connections with people. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate that at the end, he realizes that he swung the other way with these kids Mm -hmm. that he's teaching that he's like, I'm actually getting too close to them. Like I'm putting too much on myself to solve all of their problems. Right. Absolutely. I actually really appreciate it because like while what he was trying to do was lovely, it's also not realistic. And I've thought about that through the entire book. I'm like, you know, it's lovely that you're trying to look out for all these kids and everything. But at the end of the day, you're their teacher and you can't put everything on yourself. It's not healthy. And And temporary teacher. Exactly. And not living in the same city. Exactly. So it's it's not healthy. And as the fact that he is an addict, it it's it was almost trading one addiction for another on that because he liked he all of a sudden became, you know, everything for them and mm-hmm. everything. And he can't be that. It's not possible. So I really appreciated that he's like, look, I need to figure out healthy boundaries when this to where this is concerned. I still want to help kids in situations like I grew up in, but I need to figure out a healthy way to do it. And it's like, yes. Thank you. I appreciate that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and while while you can have individual support and um, successes, when you're dealing with a systemic problem, it can't be solved by an individual. Yeah. It has to be solved with, by collective action. It just, it can't, I mean, 
you can't dismantle something as awful as school systems that are clearly school to prison pipelines yeah mm-hmm. as an individual it's impossible and that's what he's in some ways trying to do like he's not delusioned enough to think that he can really achieve that for everyone but he does think he can do it for this collection of kids that he's worked with mm-hmm. he even says early on that he, i can't remember what the names are but he's like i've got i've got ty is is one of the kids that he's working with in the beginning so he's essentially like i've got a tie in like every city in the united yeah. states basically mm-hmm. is what it amounts to and it's like that's unsustainable that's the kind of things that you have nonprofit organizations for like mm-hmm. you have whole yeah. groups of people tra- attempting to achieve this which is hard this book was successful in making me cry a few times same uh it definitely was like how many themes can we shove in a book successfully because it was successful in them in my opinion and it was a lot of themes or a lot of like things that it touches on i guess maybe and i think that's why it works if i'm being so honest because i think you can't just pull at the thread of the problems of american society there's yeah. not you can't single one out and there's just this problem it's this tapestry of problems and they're all woven together and taking one thread out of that tapestry does not erase the picture well the other big thing that we kind of touched on that Shane deals with is his alcoholism mm-hmm. and addiction which comes from growing up in the foster system mm-hmm. that is something that he is is he two years clean yes i think it's two years and two months yeah if i'm remembering right because his whole reason for going to see her is it it's part of the 12-step program yeah to make amends is to make amends and so that was part of his thought process of going to see her is he wanted to make amends and then they yanked him up on stage essentially Mm -hmm. in the middle of her panel (laughs) well it it's like he well, it, one of the things he talks about in, I think it's like his, the first time we get his perspective mm-hmm. um, is that he hasn't written a word sober. He mm-hmm. hasn't he, like he starts describing like basic things. He's like, I haven't done this sober. I haven't done this sober. I haven't have done this without a drop of alcohol. And I think that because he's been coming away from that, I don't think he fully understands his own celebrity. Yeah. Yeah. So he thinks he can walk into this room and won't be recognized. And that's just not how oh it's going to be if you're in a literary space specifically for black authors and you're a world renowned black author. Mm-hmm. In some ways, it's a little delusional that he thought he wouldn't get noticed. And in other ways, it's it's it makes total endearing sense for... and hopeful. Well, it yeah. also makes total sense for somebody who had been intoxicated for most of his career yeah he just didn't realize it really even well i think there's a really good moment when he's explaining it to audra without explaining the fact that he's an alcoholic um and he just tells her that he has really bad memory like he he has Mm -hmm. like a really terrible memory and just says i don't know who i have met Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and she starts pointing people out in the room the the 12 year old and he's like i that person seems to did not like me but i don't know why like i don't know what happened that would have caused it well and it it was an interesting way of kind of showing it without actually showing how bad his alcoholism probably got because when they spent the week together when they were in high school he was staying with a friend and that friend came in and like essentially kind of tucked them in and everything and then put a bottle of vodka on the dresser because she knew he would need it when he woke up. Mm-hmm. So you're telling me this this teenager has the DTs. Yeah. Because he is that alcoholic at that point. Well, and that that perspective of and I can't remember her name. I feel I, I don't think it's going to come back to me, but that friend mm-hmm. that he has, she's 22 years old mm-hmm. yeah. and he's, when this is happening, he's 16 and they've supposedly, well, she, it says that he's got that good dick. Mm-hmm. And so like, even the people who are helping him are really not his allies. No, no. You know, as if it wasn't obvious by the fact that he's providing her drugs, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's it's made more obvious by the fact that he's being 
physically taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. And this is his like escape is he can go to this house. That's the best situation. I know it makes me so sad. Right. Well, and then they, they have this one scene. They are in high school on their bender where they go to a gas station and steal a bunch of like Twinkies and drive to the group home that he's actually supposed to be staying at because he's been kicked out of foster homes too many times that he's now at this like group home Mm -hmm. and they like put Twinkies under like the pillows or or next to the the kids' beds. And it is very heartwarming and also just so tragic. Yeah, it broke my heart and at the same time gave me the warm fuzzies and I was I was confuzzled. And I think that's what this author does so well because that's like a paragraph. Mm -hmm, Like that mm -hmm. whole thing is one paragraph. Mm -hmm. And it just keeps coming like that. I still think about it. Just that one paragraph. They they stole a bunch of Twinkies and put them under the the pillows of the foster kids in this group home. And I still think about that sentence, about that paragraph. And I'm like, well, and Genevieve, Eva, at that point is explaining this to us and explaining how sad this building is and how tragic it is. And you're like, girl... I read the description of your apartment earlier, and this is worse than that? This is terrible then. Mm -hmm. And that's what is so hard to sit with and necessary to sit with, is that it's not a fiction. This is a fiction story, but it's not based on fiction. No. Yeah. Right? And in some ways it like fires you up and makes you want to like go solve the world's problems by the time you're like done with it. And then at the same time, you're like, feel this debilitating, like, I don't know what move would make anything better. And I have to like go back to my mantra, which is something they talk about in this book a lot. Like my mantra is I can only make my corner of the world better. Mm -hmm. That's all I can do and hope it spreads out. Like that's, Well, that's exactly what we talked about when we read Half a Soul, too, Mm -hmm. right? Like, I said that weird, Half a Soul, Half (laughs) a Soul, Um, which is you can only take on the small evils, I believe, is the mantra in that book. But I'm going to shift us a little bit away from this. It's probably good. We're going to go down a dark, deep, depressing. Yeah, yeah. we'll (laughs) we'll just go and go and go until we hit the center of the earth anyway. So, but talking about the positive things about Shane and John Viev and eventually Eva, one of the things that, one of the things that I thought that was just really well delivered and done in that they're reconnecting is he refuses to call her Eva for uh, the first couple days. And then when he finally, she asks him about it, she's like, why won't you call me by my name? And he's like, because if I do, then this is real. Right. Yeah. I can still keep in the back of my mind that you are Jean Viev, the teenage girl I met when I was a messed up teen as well. If I start calling you Eva, I am here in the present with you. Mm-hmm. And it was oh, right, right to hear that. And the other line that, that he has, it, she, she says, oh, God, what was it? He's, he's she says, like, when did you? When did you start thinking about me again or something like that? And he says, I never, never learned not to. Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> the, the hopeless romantic in me was really having a day. She was having a great day reading this book. <laughs> well, and then they also had that like super cute date that wasn't a date, mm-hmm. but was kind of a date where... So setting it up, Audra has gotten herself expelled, even though she's like top tier student, knows is like winning all of these art art awards and stuff. She's managed to get herself expelled because on her Snapchat, she exposed that the one of the board members or something her that English her English teacher, teacher um, well, yeah, was stooping one of her friend's moms. Yeah. Because she has this whole online thing going on on Snapchat where she gives therapy advice to yes. other tweens, which is like... Such a bad idea. Right? Like, I completely get why everyone's trying to shut her down. Like, no, ma'am. I'm sorry. You don't know shit about anything. You are 12 years old. Yeah. 
except that when we come to her perspective and then she's actually like dealing out advice, I'm like, okay, maybe you do know a thing about a thing here. She does, but you still should not allow her to do that. No, 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 no. no. So she gets expelled unless Eva can find a replacement English teacher. And lo and behold, the magic of book world, Shane has shown back up in her life and is now teaching, is like a traveling English teacher. Right. So she has to go and convince him to do this, which took no convincing. No, he's all. just like, sure. So, yeah, I'll, I'll, whatever you ask, I will do. Right. So they have this like adorable date where they go and get gelato and walk around a park and then go to the dream house. The dream house. Yes. Where uh, these two don't sleep. No, they're supposed to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> It's a like an art installation that is essentially nap time for adults. Right. Which I, sounded amazing. I was, I was like, gonna I say want they this. were describing it and I'm like, I want to go to there. It yeah. sounds like something Meow Wolf would do. I don't know if you're familiar with their company, no. but they, they do like really odd big art installations. The big one they have in Vegas is um Area fifteen. So it's a spoof on Area fifty one. Mm-hmm. And so they've got like all these random installations but the big one is their super mart that's got a bunch of like corn for example that's you can take out the kernels and they're like squish balls and things like ra- random things like that right okay it's so it felt i was like they she didn't express explicitly call out meow wolf but i feel like that's what's happening here <laughs> <laughs> there's supposed to be like a little semper- sensory deprivation and mm-hmm and you take a nap and I was it was perfect. I was like, I want I want that. Can we have that? It sounded lovely. Mm-hmm. It also sounded like a great place to get down. Well, and they Apparently it was. the thing is they're very clear. They're like, could you please don't abuse this? They're like, don't make it weird. I think that's yeah. even a phrase that they use. Like, don't make it weird that we're having you sleep in this space. And they do. They made it weird. They made it weird. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sorry. There is no way that that room that they were in, uh, that they had the sexy times in, did not, I don't know how, how else to say this. There's did no not, way other people didn't hear them. Uh, did not hear them. And then uh, there, is a, there is a smell that comes with it. There just is. Ugh. But I know it's gross to say, but there is. If you're I mean, in a locked room having sex, <laughs> it smells like sex. <laughs> you're not You're, you're not, not wrong. wrong. <laughs> Um, so I'm just envisioning this poor attendant coming to like open the door to be like your time's up and being like, like whoa fucking sex in here <laughs> God. and one of the people is just gone yeah yeah because she bolted the fuck out of there well well and like here, here's the other aspect of it are you gonna tell me there's don't have security cameras yeah yeah what are they gonna do to you though you know I don't I don't know probably not let you back into the that's the, it the dream thing again that's all um, <laughs> they're like you're banned you, you got down we told you not to now everything has to be sprayed down <laughs> right <laughs> unsanitary <laughs> all that said it was really hot it was hot yeah it was it felt like she successfully wrote this story of pent up lust mm-hmm. over like what 15 years or something mm-hmm. uh they were yeah something like that 15 to 17 years i don't I remember she's 32 and she was 14 so that would put it at 14 she, she when 16. she meets him the first time she was a senior in high school Why they were i have in my head that she was 14 they were both seniors ignore me boo, 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 boo. <laughs> Anyway, many years later, um, <laughs> she was never in one school long enough to be there from like 14 because that's the school she graduated from. You're so right. Yeah. I think I'm conflating that with something else. You know what I'm conflating it with? The other book the, that I read this week, The the Exception to the Rule by Christina Lauren. They were 14 and 16. Mm. It was a sexy book about a 14 and your 16 year old. You you meet them when they're young and then they then they finally meet. Thank God. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it's it's no. It's okay. not it's not gross, I promise. Okay. It's sweet until it can they're adult enough to get gross. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> Wiggles would be the first one to be like this is fucking gross. Do right? Not. I would have been like chuck. <laughs> <laughs> How fucking dare you? We would have gotten a Snapchat of the book flying across the room. No. <laughs> How fucking dare you? Anyway, anyway, back to what you're saying. 
So I think they're talking about it and she's like, oh, it, uh, you know, it's been so long and probably it's probably going to be painful. And he's like, oh, it's been so long. I'm probably going to last like three seconds. And they, it is like a very brief encounter, but it is very powerful. Like yeah. I, in a way that I don't think either of them were willing to readily admit that it would be. Yes. Yes. And we had a lovely setup of this, which is the opening of the book. And the opening of the book just like killed me. I was like, okay, I'm going to like this book. Because she talks about how she almost died from swallowing gum while using her vibrator. Right? Yes. Oh, my God. The book started and I'm like, bet we're in. Let's do this. This is, this is, you know, when I saw this all over TikTok, this is the part they talked about. (laughs) So there must be more coming. (laughs) Right? Right? Holy shit. What was it called again? What? The quarterback. Uh, the quarterback. Right. And then her daughter mentions the quarterback oh, at one point, too. Yeah. And I was like, ma'am, do you know your mother has that? I think that's exactly it. <laughs> because tangenting a little bit, but Audra is very sexually educated. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right? She used and, the right names for parts. And she has to be because her mom writes ign- writes erotic novels. Mm-hmm. And you have two options as a parent in that situation. Try your damnedest to hide your kid from that, which wouldn't have worked because other kids find it and share yeah. it and it's going to be messy. we live in the digital age. Yeah. yeah. Or just head it off at the pass and have the conversations. Right. Mm-hmm. Which is what she did. Mm-hmm. But getting back to, to Shane and Eva's yes. connection, I've it felt... First of all, it was, like I said, very hot. But then it felt very, like, the come down mm-hmm. felt so natural for that to happen in that moment of, like, oh... So we fully just let 17, 15, whatever (laughs) years of lust take over. What does this fucking mean? I think I need to bail. Like, I think that this is too much for me to be processing right now. Like, that felt very natural. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. Her reaction of, and deuces was totally something I would have done. Be like, I can't with this. I'm just gonna run away. Right. Well, and the writing was so good, too, because it wasn't like, oh, we haven't seen each other in 15 years. Let's go bang in the closet. It was like, we haven't seen each other in 15 years. And, but we're also still like, have all of this frustration and unknown. But then we have this like amazing day where everything seems perfect. And then we are put in a situation like the dream house. Yeah. You're at least going to make out in there. Right. At least. Mm -hmm. I think that one of the things that she does most successfully that I didn't expect to see in a contemporary romance is it, that whole scene has the feeling of the like uh, historical romance where they've been separated by all these circumstances yeah. and, and now they're in this whirlwind romance moment, right? Um, they're swept up They're They're, they're metaphorically running across the beach to each other. You know what I mean? Like, and that, that was, I was like, man, we need to bring this into more contemporary romance, that feeling that like, (gasps) and then you can let the breath out. And I think the follow-up scenes were really good too of this, like, do we talk about it? Do Mm -hmm. we not? What happens? And then this like almost compulsion to just be like, well, I got to say something and just text something. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then having Shane come over and Audra's there accidentally or at least Eva forgot about it. And then they're like so sweet together. Yeah. It just, it created this like super nice moment. And I was like, listen, I see I am halfway through the book. It is too nice for halfway through the book. What does this mean? (laughs) (laughs) I, I, so that moment where she's like, okay, yes, come over. We'll, we'll talk about it, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And then she comes down and Audra's there and she didn't realize. And she like screamed and she's like, tell me how you feel, mommy. Correct me up. (laughs) She's like, well, they sent you an email. It is the most realistic thing I've ever heard from a parent as far as your your school emails about every fucking thing. (laughs) And they do. And they do. And that doesn't go away. Like, just like school administration has decided that, you know what? Everybody needs a minimum of 20 emails to clear out of their inbox every fucking day just to prove that they're alive. (laughs) (laughs) I swear to God. I'd be like, okay, sure, 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 sure. I also did really like the it's CC who comes over to babysit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Them getting that that time to be alone together 
where they did finally get to be like hey so what 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 we need to talk (laughs) (laughs) well and that was after this massive realization or where so eva had had thought that after the end of their bender what happens what we've learned what happens is she uh ods Mm -hmm. And her mom ends up showing up. The police are there. The paramedics are there. Everything. And then Shane disappears. And she thought that Shane just left. And that's why she has all this like rage and frustration built up. She Mm -hmm. punishes his character in her books every way you can except for killing him. Yeah. Well, and it's not just that he left. It's he left after he begged her to stay alive Mm -hmm. because he was going to take care of her. Mm-hmm. Right. And she was in so much pain that letting go would have been so much easier. Well, and at that point, she's also like doing different acts of self harm, mm-hmm. obviously, like mm-hmm. taking whatever drugs she can get her hands on to help like alleviate the pain and stuff. So, what she finds out when she finally asks Shane, Why did you leave? He's like, You need to talk to your mom about that. I didn't leave by at least by, by my own choice. And so she f- learns from her mom in that terrible, heartbreaking scene that Shane got sent to prison. Mm-hmm. Right. And that he called her mom. Yeah. Well, and he, he ends up doing, I think it's like two years in juvie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, he gets tried. He says he gets tried as an adult. Oh, so he does two years. He does two years, though. Of something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I can't remember what it was. I think it was just prison. Was it? I think so. That's awful. Yeah. Because he says he says that's where he wrote eight his first book, and we also get a number of other realizations in that because that's the the scenes when they were kids are are from Genevieve's Eva's perspective, and so we don't get to see his his emotions in it. And when she finally talks to him about it, he's like, "You don't understand how terrified I was." Right. Like that entire week, he's talking about you know what if she cuts too deep, mm-hmm. what if she takes too much what if she you know does all of this stuff or the pain is too much and that was also just heartbreaking to read Mm -hmm. about this like 16 17 year old just begging another child Mm -hmm. to stay alive Mm -hmm. so anyway one of the things that i'm bringing it back a little bit full circle to something we talked about at the beginning that uh, eva is really big on breaking cycles right Mm -hmm. and there's a moment where she does get after Audra because of what she has gotten in trouble for school at and rightfully is kind of like listen kid you fucked up right you need Mm -hmm. to you need to own this you fucked up but there's a point where she's thinking in her head of how much better she's made it for her kid compared to her mom who has also had that thought process I don't think we ever get that point of view from her, but it's clear in her actions that she has mm-hmm. the thought process of I've done so much better for you than my mom did for me. Right. Mm-hmm. And what I really like about that is yes, she has this, this argument with her. Yes. She calls it. I think she even goes as far to call her an ungrateful little shit or, or, or an ungrateful tween. Like she yeah. stops herself. Yeah. That was pretty good. But that she does later on sort of reckon with, Nope, you can't be thinking that way because, yeah, you are making it better for her intentionally. Mm-hmm. Right. She shouldn't She shouldn't be grateful for having the life that she should have, a life that you should have had, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that's so hard for people who come from, like, whether it is traumatic backgrounds or poor backgrounds or whatever, to to stop and be like, okay... Just because this person has life better doesn't mean that that negates anything else that they're going through. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Audra is 12. Yeah. She's going through all sorts of shit that 12 year old girls go Absolutely. through. She should be an ungrateful little shit. Yeah. yeah. That's what being 12 is about. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> 12 year old girls are assholes. We all were. Yes. You if grow you were, out of it mostly. If you weren't a demon when you were 12, are you okay now? I was going to say, if you weren't a demon when you were 12, I don't trust you. If you were female, men usually take it a little later, do that a little later. But 12 year old girls are assholes. Like we just we were. Uh, yeah. Middle school is the worst time oh, of God, my whole I life. I fucking hated middle school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, y'all tries had to it change so much- subject to not my middle school experience. <laughs> y'all had it so much worse than me, too, admittedly, because y- 
you were in such a smaller schools. There, there's no hiding. No, no in exactly. Small schools, like you know. I was in a bigger school, and while yes, there are many girls that to this day I want to be, I want to walk up and be like, "You were a cunt." I got to escape that to a degree, and I also got to escape it in high school because then we branched off into different high schools. Oh no, you just keep going to school with those kids. Yep. Sorry but about that, girls. Anyway, <laughs> getting back to this, right. But, you know, speaking about the difference, too, in in lifestyles between Eva and Audra, Eva has no friends. No. She self-admittedly, like, doesn't even know really how to make friends because she's moved around so much. Mm -hmm. Versus Audra somehow manages to get 20 people into her apartment. Yeah. (laughs) And the babysitter's like, I didn't sign on for this, ma'am. So I don't do crowds. I, 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 don't, I don't do groups. Like, I love that she immediately just sends the message to her like, I can't handle this. <laughs> I don't think that there is a solution to that where that isn't. Excuse me, I'm afraid you're going to need to come home. There yes. are 20 yeah. children in your apartment. Including a 16 year old boy. Right. Yeah. And that was what really flipped her out. She's like, um, excuse me. Mm-hmm. Not OK. I, which he didn't have any nefarious reasons. I really no. don't think. But. But I think it's fair to be anxious of really any 16-year-old hanging out with a 12-year-old. Yep. Like, right. like, but why? Why? 12-year-olds are awful. No offense to 12-year-olds, but you also shouldn't be listening to this podcast if you're 12 yeah, years what old. Yeah, what are you Should doing? Not. Go away. <laughs> uh, I do like, though, that that co- idea of Audra being like the popular kid or whatever kind of gets turned on its head when she's talking to Shane at the party. Mm-hmm. And she's just like, I don't really like any of them they're all shits yeah kinda. and it's like she's just like i'm just waiting to be an adult mm-hmm. there are some kids that i swear to god are adults at five yeah, yeah. like like not obviously mentally physically or anything like that but but like their presence they have somehow more maturity than some 30 year olds i know yeah and you're like what is your deal old soul shit or are you like are you evil like are you <laughs> right are you a sociopath are you the omen kid like <laughs> what is it <laughs> it's just the antichrist i admittedly to a degree was a little bit that like people my age annoyed the shit out of me i was told i was a bossy for my age <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do a hard left. Why not? Okay. Why not do a very abrupt subject change? You are the queen of the hard left. Do it. Am I? Yes. Neat. Partly because you say that phrase quite a bit. <laughs> you do, <Aww>. actually. Yeah. <laughs> That's not a catchphrase I want. <laughs> well. Anyway, so the end of the book, it, not not the end, but like the, I don't know, it feels like an epilogue, but it's not. The last chapter-ish it i was i surprisingly loved so shane fucks up but doesn't fuck up but kind of fucks up when he doesn't do the brunch with eva and uh audra he had a very good reason he had a very good reason mm-hmm. ty one of his kids got shot and he had to fly to philly is that what yes. what so he arrives back and that's when they have this whole conversation that they like can't do this but then we spend like this whole chapter throughout July or whatever of them like texting and still trying to like be in each other's lives or just maybe more importantly, not having the ability to not be in each other's lives. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I I didn't know how I was going to feel about that. But as I was reading it, I was just like, this is delightfully heartwarming watching them just mm-hmm. like solidify their relationship well i kind of like it too because it's more of a allowing them to really get to know each other more than anything because as wiggles has pointed out like realistically the amount of time that they've physically spent together is 14 days yeah Mm -hmm. and so the the texting back and forth and just kind of like little how's you know the how your days moments and everything are are more of an opportunity to actually get to know each other without the looming presence of you physically being there. I think my favorite part of that was her sending him a voice memo because she wasn't prepared to hear his voice, but Mm -hmm. knew that he needed hers. Yeah. When she did that, I was like, (gasps) that is the interesting thing about the fact that they don't know each other really and yet also seem to know each other very well, mm-hmm. which which comes back to them being like having this almost soulmate thing. Right, right. Yeah. 
I am going to take us in a different hard left. Oh, good. You're welcome. I honestly would genuinely read this cursed series. Oh, (laughs) I don't know. Some of the things she's describing that he has platinum fangs, that every time they orgasm, they get transported to opposite ends of the world but that's the part i like really i'm like I actually kind of the like, angst it would of kind that of be my jam too oh that would be too much for me i'd be like this is too cringe oh i love the i'm um, you know i'm an angsty bitch i love it <laughs> that would be the point where liz goes what the fuck and tosses the book <laughs> i'd be like this is dumb i would 100 percent be behind the story where they like consistently have to fight to get together but then the moment immediately they get torn down apart i i would be behind that you know the thing that i liked about her being this author is from the beginning of the book right she is a, a very niche author right like mm-hmm. she does have fans and a lot of people love her love her books to the point where she's working on a film deal but she's not really like renowned in the literary space the award at the end, the Littles, I believe, mm-hmm. is her first time winning one of these awards mm-hmm. on book 14. Mm-hmm. Whereas Shane is known by everyone. He just walks in and everybody's like, oh my gosh, it's Shane Hall. But we get all of these glimpses into the fact that she is way more famous than she thinks she is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because at the Dream House, the person who's like checking them in or something is like a big fan but she would never admit to it and like there's these these uh different fans who wear purple hats or like witches hats and stuff Mm -hmm. and i kind of just liked the the story there uh of eva kind of almost thinking negatively about herself and her writing when Mm -hmm. realistically like it's it's not this oh i'm just writing these erotic novels to get by it's like there are people who are really big fans of you and you are more popular than you realize Mm -hmm. well i think too there's a factor where it's like her primary demographic to her knowledge is middle-aged white women Mm -hmm. right and so it also doesn't feel like she's serving herself i think in some ways and i uh, that's why i think they have that establishing scene where she's interacting with this fan club i can't remember what they're called that are celebrating her and her achievements and she's just like yeah (laughs) (laughs) would you go to that i don't ever okay I am not the type of person who actually wants to ever meet anybody whose art I enjoy. Like, I'm I'm never like, oh, I want to meet Beyonce. I'm right. sure Beyonce is great. But also, no, I, I'm, I'm, I like looking at art from afar. And so I don't have a strong desire to meet any of the authors of the books we've ever read. I don't have a strong desire no. to have like the that that's just not for me i'm not judging anybody who would want it but like no i'm the same way mostly i would meet david Tennant in a heartbeat i've never been somebody who's had like a celebrity crush you know like i i remember being young and like crushing on characters in tv shows and stuff i like but i was never like oh my gosh this is the celebrity that i'm crushing on yeah mm-hmm. no well, that's the thing for me, like if there's ever been a crush on on somebody who is of celebrity, it's not them. It's the character they played right. or, or you get like that sort of like crush on because of their art and yeah. so, and reading them through that. Right. So like I, I, I might have a crush on somebody because of the book that they wrote, because I'm like, oh, like this is a piece of you. So I have a crush on that piece of you. Right. But like, I don't know anything about you or your life and I don't want to, to a certain extent. Like I, I would prefer to know that you're not a shitty person. Yeah. That'd be cool. So if you could just not be shit, that'd be great. I'd be too afraid that it would ruin my, my love of that particular thing. Right. Well, so here's an example where I didn't, hadn't quite figured that out about myself yet. I'm a big fan of a lot of the plays that Harvey Firestein has written. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think they're great. And so <laughs> I did have a chance to meet him. It was cute. Uh, he was trying to get out of the rain and was like, 
no man no i'm sorry guys i can't like you shouldn't be here i shouldn't be here i got another performance later like i can't be out in this rain right Right. and i sort of had this moment where i was like for five seconds disappointed because i did wait to see him and then i was like all right moved on from that like i didn't i was like i'm never gonna be like oh no ah shucks we didn't get a chance for me to awkwardly ask for his autograph. Right. <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. I've met like just a handful of celebrities. Like I could probably literally name most of them. And I don't ever look back on those moments. It, those aren't moments where I'm like, oh my gosh, remember the time that you met Jason David Frank, who was like your childhood crush because he was the Green Ranger? Like, no, it was awkward as fuck because sightings are weird and awkward as fuck. Right? Like that's that's the thing. It's like... I would love to sit down and have a conversation sometime with some of these people. But the idea of like actually going to a a signing and be like, I'm your biggest fan that like internally Uh -uh. I am screaming. (laughs) Yeah, no. No, thank you. You know who it was an awkward meeting? George Dakai. It was not. It was not. He was awesome. (laughs) Um, But here's the real question. Would you go to that like restaurant they went to? No, no. I don't like not being in control. Uh, mm-hmm. And I certainly w- that you can pay me to have somebody with their grubby ass hands touching the food I'm about to eat and putting it in my mouth when my hands are handcuffed behind a chair. I don't know how she did that. I would have lost my ever loving shit. Yeah, same. I don't know how she did that in front of strangers. Right. So it's this BDSM restaurant. BDSM restaurant where you can like choose because she chose to be handcuffed and like fed cookies right no thank you no yeah no no, no. thanks i'd rather die uh-uh. Uh-uh. i'm kinky and i'm like no thanks i mean maybe maybe there are some other things on the list on the menu that'd be interesting but i'm not doing it with a bunch of fucking strangers uh no you no i would not i would not could not no the full length of green eggs and ham no <laughs> <laughs> Without the acceptance. Yes. No. Just, no. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. I would not at all enjoy that restaurant. In fact, I'd be, I'd probably go screaming in the other direction. Okay. So I had this thought mm-hmm. when I was wrapping up the book. And the, the, this book is a romance, uh-huh. technically, as it is qu- like the genre it is. But is it though? Because I feel like, I mean, I suppose technically the romance is the main plot, but I feel like the point of the book is both of them overcoming like their individual issues Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the romance is kind of just there to usher that along. I would agree with that. Yeah, I agree with that. I also think we are used to a particular style of romance that this doesn't fit into. Yeah. And I I think that this is... This is what I almost would say is the blending between fiction and and romance. And and I almost would love to see a little bit more of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because I, while I while I love um silly frilly romances, I I also really like having something like this that feels so much more grounded in reality. Yeah. And something where mm-hmm. just because it's hard doesn't mean it can be made easy by the fact that you're in love, right? Mm-hmm. Or that problems can't be solved because you conveniently happen to be in love with the person who can solve those problems. Uh, don't get me wrong. I'm never going to stop reading those. Oh, I no. Love, oh, no. I love having joy. Um, <laughs> I, I like not being sad for weeks on end while I think about a story over and over again. But something like this is, is special. Mm-hmm. Um, I agree. And I want it to not be, not in the sense that I don't want to, to still elevate books like this, but I want I want this genre to flourish and grow a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Because I think the examples of this that we have that are that bleeding between fiction and romance are, most of them feel f- much more firmly rooted in fiction. I agree. I agree. And I, I'd like a little bit more. And in general, I'm saying I like this book. <laughs> so why don't we rate it? Well, we'll start off with the first rating, which is Spice. What you got for me? You know, I think that this is like a two. Yeah. I was uh, thinking two as well. It has one really steamy scene, but the 
the spice of it does not feel like it's about the spice. It was definitely like one of those books that I read the steamy scene and then, you know, we got into the next scenes and I almost forgot about it. I was just like Mm -hmm. that. It was a nice scene, but it was not the point. Mm. Yeah. The spice scene was written well. And I definitely there's definitely times where I appreciate one like really well written spice scene as opposed to a bunch of them that are maybe not as well written and or just kind of the same thing over and over again so i i mean i agree with the two it was not overly spicy but i will say the spice that was given was very well written i yeah. agree with that what about romance oh, that one's a lot more complicated to determine isn't it, it? Is. because in some ways it's like it's like four at least yeah because you're like wow this like deep-seated passion that they neither one of them can get rid of but in other ways it has to be like a two or lower because like you said this isn't really about the romance it's about the characters healing yeah Mm -hmm. so i i honestly don't know I think I'm going to land at a three point five mm-hmm. because I, I, a three feels a little too like I don't know easy or just like a like a throwaway. But I just I can't bring myself to bump it up to a four. Mm-hmm. So I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna stick with three point five. I think I'm gonna echo your rating. Okay. And I am actually going just a step down. I am going to say a three. And my only justification is is because I I liked them together. But it also would have not upset me if they did take their separate paths and stay that way. Mm-hmm. That's fair. Yeah. So your overall rating. This is a really well-crafted book. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I do have one gripe that we really didn't talk about, but she navigates it so well that I, it almost doesn't need as much time delivered to it. The transitions of point of view in chapter were really hard to follow. That's like the only yes. complaint I have about mm-hmm. the book in terms of writing, delivery, all that. It Otherwise, it is so beautifully written and it's so intelligently considerate of the perspectives that it's choosing to give you those moments in. So I just wish there was like some kind of labeling yeah, to, I let, agree. to let people like me who are easily confused in, in the loop. So I'm going to give this a 4.5. And the only reason it's not a 5 is because of that that writing complication that makes it harder for me me to consume it i'm gonna agree with a 4.5 um but my reasoning is there is a specific emotion and feel that i get from five book like five star books Mm. and it's not that like all of my five star books are the same but there is this almost giddiness that i get when i'm done reading it this high Mm. almost Mm -hmm. and i didn't quite get that with this Mm. so it's a 4.5 it also for me, and that's about the same. It's it's the feels for me, and there's just a certain feeling that when I get done, I almost go into book depression. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, when I get done with like my five star books, and so it was it was close, but it wasn't quite there. Yeah. Um. Usually the the vibe for me I can tell is if I finish a book and immediately just want to reread it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know what I I think that's what I'm a little bit different from you guys on that that. And maybe this is because I did have to transition into audiobook in the sure. middle. Mm-hmm. But I do wanna I do wanna read it again because I feel like there's more to pull out of it. Oh yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well that leads us to recommendations. So I'm going to repeat a recommendation from yours truly, and that is Happy Place by Emily Henry, which I think is actually mm-hmm. a better recommendation for this book than it was for yours truly, because that is also a second chance romance and it's told through a lot of these flashbacks um, from the present time when they're in their 30s to back when the the couple and and the, the characters all meet each other and then fall in love and stuff. So that story really feel similar to this where it's also like was this a romance or was it really just about the characters growing and then finding themselves and finding each other again I don't know so that's my recommendation so this is kind of it's it's a weird thought process with this one but go with me so I'm gonna do half a soul by Olivia Atwater okay so this is solely based on having to overcome the the problems or the disabilities in yourself 
So like it, I know it's a weird, it's a weird justification for it and everything. But in Half a Soul, she she is doesn't have any emotions, and she's had to learn how to mirror other people and everything. And a lot of people who have like autism and stuff like that have to do that as well. And it's just about overcoming disabilities and overcoming perceived problems in your life. Well, and the romance in that, like this one, is also about meeting oh what the uh, Dora. The, mm-hmm. the main character and have a soul like where she is mm-hmm. instead of trying to fix or change her. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yes. My recommendation this week is going to be a play that I worked on almost 10 years ago uh, called Yellow Man by Dale Orlander Smith. Um, and that one also has uh, two kids that uh, get to interact with each other later on as they grow up. Um, it's a, complicated conversation that's sort of simplified um but still has quite a bit of nuance about colorism um and so one character has darker skin than the other the other one the lighter skinned one is referred to as a yellow man um it's a really great play if you can see it performed but even reading it is a really great experience so that's my recommendation oh okay well, that's the episode, folks. If you like this episode, please find us out there on the socials at Wrong Dust Jackets on TikTok, Instagram, Threads, Pinterest, YouTube. You can find us out on our website at wrongdustjackets.com. That's going to have blog posts for other books that we've read and reviewed. It's going to have all of the upcoming episodes that we're going to do for season two coming at you soon. And we'd love to hear from you. So drop a comment, drop a like, give us five stars on whatever app you're listening to. That would surely help us a whole bunch. Thanks so much, y'all. Bye now. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.